we are going to start uh, the second lecture of the day. Uh, I'll be the, the speaker. Um, I'm mainly going to talk about EMG-based interfaces for neuromodulation. So if I may give a very nice talk about uh, how uh, high-density EMG and recordings from the periphery can be used to decode uh, brain states and suprospinal uh, cortical oscillations and how they could be applied uh, in order to induce some neuroplasticity and neuromodulation. Uh, my main goal here is to uh, give some notes about uh, how neuroplasticity occurs in the in the in this kind of paradigms, and we'll go through different uh, BCI approaches, uh, both using EEG and high density MD and other kind of input signals in order to induce plasticity in different conditions. So, first of all, let's define what's neuroplasticity, which uh, it refers to the capacity of the nervous system to modify, to adapt uh, when it's in front of some changes, which could be experience or, or uh, some, some neural injury. For instance, after a stroke, even you have a, a brain injury, there, are, uh, there is cell death, there is plasticity occurring because the nervous system is quite uh, plastic because it can adapt to changes in order to, to survive. And we want to in this field, we want to take advantage of this plasticity that can be achieved by, uh, by inducing some re repetitive per activation of a synapse or a circuit. And this is the mechanism that leads to plasticity. It was defined by HEP uh, almost 70 years ago. And I think it's quite intuitive uh, and mechanisms because if we have two, neuro two neurons, like we will have like just single synaps synapses occurring through the neuron. And that will not induce plasticity. But when two inputs converging at the same neuron at the same time with very specific timing, then it's where plasticity occurs because we are uh, reinforcing, reinforcing the, the learning and mechanisms for the neuron. And then that syn synapse could be strengthened or uh, uh, it could be also uh, lose the, the strength if we are talking about uh, some depression. So the final goal in this field is to increase or decrease the excitability of a synapse or a neural circuit that will allow to facilitate some neural adaptations. The final outcome will be to promote functional recovery. So this is our very simplified nervous system. We have the brain, we have the spinal cord, and from the brain, some efferent commands are input into the spinal cord and then to the muscles, and then we have afferent information that through the proprioceptive system, proprioception system, it's coming back to the brain. We integrate that information and we learn. The problem is that when we have some kind of neural injury, such as a stroke, pathological tremor, pain, spinal cord injury, any other neural injury, we have some disruption in this transmission from the brain to the periphery. And then we need to define some kind of uh, action uh, in order to revert the the state of the nervous system to, to become functional again. And that's why uh, we try to uh, overcome this limitation through neuromodulation, which uh, it can be set to different, uh, to different paradigms, which can be neurofeedback, in which we uh, display some information to the subject based on some neural states. And then through operant condition and the subject will be able to neuromodulate that activity. And always we try to shift that those changes towards functional recovery. And then we different, we have different kind of uh, neural interfaces based on trans not transcranial magnetic stimulation, TMS, transcranial uh, direct or alternating current stimulation in the brain. It can be applied in the cerebellum as well. We also have stimulation from the periphery to peripheral nerve stimulation. And one kind of stimulation close enough, it's functional electrical stimulation, which doesn't uh, only look for the recruitment of the nerves, but also some muscle activation that will support uh, some assistive functions. Coming back to the concept of how can we induce plasticity uh, using this kind of technologies, the best example was uh, defined by Stefan Atoll, Jaime briefly defined it, and it's just the application of the HEP principle. So we have a subject, we have the TMS, and we have some peripheral nerve stimulation. If we compare the stimulation of the TMS at the cortex and peripheral stimulus, and we can time them so they arrive at the exact time in the cortex, then plasticity can occur. 
um, we can use the TMS to measure the motor evoked potential as a measure of corticospinal excitability. And here is a sample. When the activity is per at very exact time for that specific subject, we have that after the repetition of 90 stimuli, we have in the post assessment that the MEP has increased. And the final goal uh, would be that this is translated into some functional outcome. If the, um, we're not showing the results here, but if the pairing is not within this uh, very few milliseconds time window, the plasticity does not occur because the, uh, the synapses uh, are not happening at the right time. So the main uh, message here is that precise timing is essential to activate, to activate uh, a specific plasticity mechanism. Then we have uh, this framework that has been developed in the last year from which we could use uh, peripheral uh, recordings from high density EMG and also intramuscular EMG that could be used to decode uh, signals that previously were only accessible through uh, some uh, EEG technologies or even more basic technologies. So now we have the chances to have surrogates or estimation of brain activity coming from the periphery. And this leads us to the first example of uh, BCI, which are the classical BCI conditioning paradigms. And let's have an overview of which kind of signals uh, these BCIs use in order to, to trigger the stimulation or whatever uh, mechanism uh, we are using. So on the one hand, yesterday we had Kieran, we gave a nice overview of the EEG signals, how it can be pre-processed pre and some of the most basic features we can extract from, from the EEG. So one of these signals are the cortical rhythms. Uh, we're going to focus here, here on the alpha and beta bands when, and that are related to movement preparation. So if we have uh, some cue-based paradigms in which the subject is going to, it's getting ready to, to perform a movement, we can see that in the alpha and beta band, uh, just before the, the movement happens, there's an even related desynchronization. It means like, uh, in the steady states, in idyllic states, we have the brain with highly synchronized rhythms. Uh, it seems like the neurons tend to work better when they are in these resting states. But then when something is about to happen, the different neural populations, they synchronize. And this can be measured through the EEG in the alpha and beta bands. And that we have this decrease in the power of the, of the beta and alpha power. And then once that period is recovered, the movement is being produced, we have a re-synchronization uh, re of the on the rhythms. So these both signals can be used in order to provide some neurofeedback to the subject. So uh, in, in the BCIs, they can try to modulate, upregulate, downregulate in order to have some functional impact. Then we have the movement-related cortical potentials, which these are two the same but similar version of the of the same mechanism, which is the CMV, the contingent negative variation, and the self-paced uh, BP potential, uh, which is basically, again, when the subject wants to move, there is uh, some slow cortical potential that can be measured with the EEG that reflects this movement preparation just before the start of the of the movement. Itself. And then the idea is that we can trigger some stimulation based based on on these events. In this case, again, timing is essential as we are going to see in the following slides uh, in order to achieve plasticity or not. Um, both kind of paradigms require like the subject uh, has to undergo some training and we saw as well in the hands-on training activity. And not all the subjects are sort of for this kind of BCIs because not the, this kind of potentials, the subjects are not always able to to, to generate them so a classifier can, can actually detect them. So that's maybe the weakest point. And also you, it requires several trials, several means of training in order to generate them. Um, continuing with some introduction about like how the stimulation can be used to induce this kind of plasticity. The afferent pathway, pathways are those sensory pathways that drive sensory information to the uh, central nervous system. There are many kind of receptors, and just take, let's go take a look of the muscle uh, muscle spindles which drive the 1A uh, 
driven by the one afferent fibers, which mass, uh, which measures the the muscle length. So it tells the nervous system if the muscle is length, it's contracted. We have the 1B fibers measured by the Golgi tendon organs, which measure the tension in the muscles. And we have other kinds of receptors. And all these uh, set of receptors are used by the nervous system to induce proprioception. So that's the perception we have. If Even if we close our eyes, we know where our muscles are. We know the position of our joints. And the, final, the goal is to exploit like this recruitment of these affin fibers, time it with the some brain states so we can promote the plasticity in after some neural input. The first paradigm, like uh, actually Dario, I was part of, of this, uh, this project, is a classic example of associate uh, BCI, brain computer interface, uh, in which we have a subject. Uh, we measure the cortical spinal excitability with the uh, MEP. And later in the hands-on training activity, we have some demonstration on how uh, TMS works. Uh, and we'll have a look at some MPs as well. So we measure in the TA, we place the surface uh, electrodes we, that will give us the MEP, so the motor block potential amplitude. It's a potential, and we can measure the peak-to-peak. -peak, and this will be our variable to estimate the cortical spinal excitability. So this will give us uh, how excitable it's our cortical spinal tract. The changes could be happening in the spinal cord, what could be happening in the brain. So we cannot differentiate it with this kind of uh, uh, metric. Then we have the intervention, in which uh, in this case, we have classic EEG montage. And we ask uh, they ask the subject to perform like repetitive task, cue-based task in, in this kind of paradigms in which the subject um, uh, Focus warning is presented. Then he has to get or she has to get ready for the start of the movement. And then there is a second queue in which the subject is asked to move. So the EEG is recorded, and then the MRCP is extracted during a training session. And it's this very nice potential, and it has a peak. And this peak is more or less happening just a few milliseconds before the onset of the movement. So the whole hypothesis here was that by timing the stimulation given through uh, some peripheral stimulation at the per peroneal nerve, the one uh, innervating uh, the tibialis anterior, so what will happen is that uh, if we stimulate at this point, the hypothesis is that we will have an increase in the MEP size. But if we stimulate right before or right after this uh, negative peak, the plasticity will not occur. And they show that uh, they did this uh, a few days, but we are just looking here at the first day. So in black, we have the, the baseline uh, intensity of the, 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 the baseline uh, motor block potential size. So this is the peak to peak amplitude of the MEP. And we have the different intensities at which the uh, TMS uh, was stimulated. So this is a traditional input-output curve, which gives you like the spin uh, spinal cortical excitability like at different intensities. And they reported that after the BCI associative paradigm, there was an increase in the cortical spinal excitability. But for the non-associative BCI, so when no timing was uh, was achieved, then we have that such cortical spinal excitability uh, didn't happen. So uh, the uh, positive uh, effects of this kind of therapy for, for instance, a stroke patients is that it doesn't require residual motor activation because these uh, potentials can be generated just with motor imagery. So in case patients are severely uh, injured, um, there's no need to have some residual activity. There was an increase in corticospinal excitability. And when they translated this paradigm into some uh, stroke patients, there were some immediate effects in functional outcomes. The problem with these kind of paradigms is that usually uh, the sample sizes are not that large and the training of often lasts for maybe one day or just a few days of them. The functional outcomes and how it is correlated to the changes in corticospinal excitability of other kind of uh, neurophysiological measures 
is not always clear and there should be more work towards this direction just to prove that these therapies are really effective and it's worth to to have them integrated in the clinics we have another example um, that this is a pilot i and myself were involved uh, a few years ago in which we can even get more complex setups with this kind of associated paradigms and here we have the subjects we have the stroke patients and um, instead of applying just peripheral nerve stimulation just to induce some afferent feedback uh, so the stimulation wasn't limited just to this uh, afferent stimulation but it was also a functional electrical stimulation device that was trying to provide some assistance while the subjects were doing this kind of uh, extension grasping moving and in order to make things easier this is some sort of hybrid therapy in which we also use a an exoskeleton and passive upper limb exoskeleton, which is the arm spring, which supports the arm, the arm against gravity. And the whole system was run by also some uh, neural network uh, based on uh, feedback, feed, uh, feedback error learning, which would adapt the stimulation intensity to guide the subject to reach the target in the fastest way. So this was quite complex setup. And Unfortunately, at some point we discontinued the study, but we had a few cases studies in which we saw like exactly what Natalie showed before, that there was an increase when we used the, the, the brain uh, computer interface associative paradigm. So when the stimulation was rightly timed with the MRCP, we could see an increase in the MEPs at different intensities. And we could see as well, like in the first uh, weeks of the treatment, there was also some improvement in the range of motion of the kinematics while the subjects were doing this uh, this switching task. So this was a complex setup, and it's difficult to translate to the clinics because it's like I want to make this also in this presentation, which I will give maybe my personal experience with this kind of interventions. It's always difficult to get quite representative uh, sample population of patients because. The inclusion exclusion criteria are, are quite exigent uh, or restrictive for, for the clinicians because if we are doing TMS, they cannot have any uh, history of epilepsy, otherwise, they will be discarded. We need the patient with sufficient immobility so they can aim by themselves and try to perform the reaching task. So, these uh, studies uh, were limited in, the, in, that, in that sense. And now the whole point of the workshop is translated here. So uh, this is a study uh, performed by, by Hu and, and Jaime. Uh, I think uh, it was published the last year, a couple of years ago now. And it's a good example because it's, it represents the transition from the EG BCI paradigm that we were seeing before, in which the MRCP potential was used to trigger the stimulation. And we highlighted the importance to have that potential to trigger the stimulation that very specific time in just maybe 25 milliseconds window. And they, they replicated the experiments we saw, but instead of having the EEG to trigger the stimulation, they just have the EMG. So they asked the subject to perform a cue-based task. So there's a warning stimulus to rest, get ready. When the red dot uh, came to the center of the of the white cross, the subject was asked to perform like this movement with the tip of the finger. And in the training phase, the subject so uh, gets trained. The, the reaction time is measured from the EMG, so very basic EMG processing, just rectification, as I think Sylvia explained, explained it yesterday, just when the activity exceeds certain threshold over the baseline level, we and they estimate like that's muscle activity so they measure the reaction time and then for each specific subject they set the stimulation time like 30 milliseconds before in order to have some time for the afferents to go up to the supraspinal to the brain and then promote the plasticity at the precise uh, timing they selected three, three different times so just 30 milliseconds before the subject on average, perform the movement at the exact time the subject was performing the movement or 15 milliseconds later. And the results show that 
the MEPs uh, here were larger uh, and even were man this increase was maintained after 15 minutes for the minus 30 milliseconds uh, condition. So it means if the stimulation is timely arrived with the movement preparation, plasticity of your why if the stimulation was delivered at different time instance, that increase was not so clear or it did, did, didn't even happen at all. So this is a, a very nice example of how brain states, in this case, the CNC, CNV uh, potential can be estimated via surface CNG. And actually, I'm not showing it here, but they also show, show like using this offline data, they recorded that for this minus 30 milliseconds, uh, condition when they analyze offline the, the MRCP potential, they show that actually the stimulation was delivered around that negative peak, which means we can use EMG from the periphery to have some surrogate of some brain states. And this kind of application makes things easier if we want to get these things translated from the research, from an EG lab to the clinic, because we avoid the limitations of training of having mental fatigue, having the subject uh, heavily training to, to have the classifiers working. And also we avoid the complex EEG setup. Also yesterday we showed maybe the EEG was faster for the first time than the EEG. And again, like what I want to highlight maybe in every slide is that timing is fundamental. So the afferent stimulation that reaches the brain much reaches the cortex, the, the motor cortex during the movement preparation and not after, or just when it actually happened. And now we move forward to a different kind of operant conditioning uh, paradigms, uh, also based on BCI. And um, I don't know if you are familiar with operant conditioning, but it's when the subject learn, learns to associate certain behavior with a consequence. I think the most clear example could be like some animal experiments in which we have uh, an animal, it's presented with two different stimuli, a stimulus, and they have to choose one of them and you can reward or punish their decision based on the kind of uh, behavior you want to, you want to promote. Um, and it, it applies the same to humans and we can have some neurofeedback in order to induce this kind of uh, behaviors. I also want to highlight like how the spinal cord plays a key role in motor control Always we are focusing on the brain, supraspinal activity, EEG, but the spinal cord is actually a really important processing center that it's integrating all the supraspinal input, all the upper inputs, and it's the final stop before the these neural commands switch the muscles. And this key role of the of the spinal cord is also important with some uh, proprioception processing which is essential in motor learning and it's related to this uh, operant conditioning uh, paradigm. Um, so yeah, finally, yeah, as well, like, and the spinal cord is modulated for, uh, from the brain to different brain uh, states and different supraspinal inputs and different spinal reflexes. And I'll do a demonstration uh, right now. So I want to show like this very basic, uh, the spinal reflex, the most basic one called the stretch reflex, which when we apply st electrical stimulation, the analogous is the H reflex. So this is a, a reflex that is coded in most of our joints. We have the muscle spindles that measure the lengthening of the of the muscle. And this information is driven by the 1A afferent fibers to the spinal cord. So if a muscle is over length, means it could be potentially in danger. And it will activate the firing of the, these one airframe fibers up through the spinal monosynaptic because it's only one synapse reflex. It will activate the monimus motor neuron in order to produce the contraction of the muscle and therefore it will protect it from being damaged. This is the most uh, extreme case. And maybe one of the example is this kind of reflex when you are sitting in a, in a chair and they hit you right uh, below the patella the knee will be extended. So this is a protection mechanism. But the reflexes are not only working during those extreme conditions. And for instance, in gait, they are constantly engaged and importantly, like in an important way, managed by the spinal cord, always under the supervision of the 
of the supraspinal system. And the analogous of this uh, natural uh, stretch plex can be elicited by stimulating the median nerve, for instance, in this case, uh, we stimulate the one afferent fibers artificially. This will activate the fibers. This uh, activation will go through the motor neuron and will get this kind of potentials. So if the stimulation goes above the motor threshold, it will mean that we will also stimulate the motor axons and we'll get in the first place the M wave that happens first. And secondly, at the same time, the afferent fibers is activated. This goes back to the spinal cord all the way around and then we get the H reflex. In theory, because of the larger diameter of one of fibers, the H reflex, the afferent fibers, are reproduced first. So in theory, we should have some, we could record some uh, signals in which the M wave is minimal or absence, and we only have H reflex. And regarding the conditioning of the H, of the different reflexes modulated by the, by the brain, and some operant conditioning example, I think it's a good example, for instance, when you are holding a glass or something, and if you are in an unbalanced position and you get uh, disturbed, your brain uh, primary goal maybe will be to keep the balance for sure, not to fall, but you will have the hand steady and you will uh, promote co-contraction in order the glass will be steady and it, you don't spill the water, right? But if you don't have any, any glass and the same perturbation occurs, your spinal cord reflexes will be tuned in order to maximize the stabilization of your body. So you will hold into something, you will see, you will seek for stabilization immediately. So that's why it's important how the brain states also are reflected in, in spinal cord level. And maybe that's why we can see how this, this can be used later in, in neuromodulation. And this is just an example of the H reflex. What I told you before, we have, this is a flexocapio radialis at the wrist, H reflex. We have the stimulation artifacts at the median nerve. The stimulation goes uh, in the one direction through the motor neuron uh, axon. It produces the M wave, and around 50 milliseconds is the latency at which the, the, uh, the, the potential has reached the spinal cord, came back, and we have the H wave. As soon as we increase the stimulation intensity, we have an increase in the M waves and the H reflex increases until it's saturated, and then the H reflex potential is cancelled by the M wave recruitment. And this leads us to, leads us to, to this uh, very nice example of, of plasticity by Eichel Thompson and, and Wolpo, in which they design a quite ambitious uh, protocol. They've been doing this, they have been doing this in rats in the, in the previous year, so it's a long story. And the main goal was to use the H reflex and the modulation of the H reflex by providing it as a feedback to the subject in order to upregulate it or downregulate it. And they uh, planned this study, not in just one single session, but multi session study, uh, I don't remember, to 24 sessions, like um, through different weeks. So they get the subjects uh, some assessment trains in which they assess the, the H reflex. Uh, at the solis, because it's the easiest muscle uh, in the lower limb to, to get these kind of reflexes. After the baseline, so they have very nice estimation of the real MEP amplitude, uh, MEP, sorry, uh, like potential amplitude of the H reflex, they started the intervention, in which they provided the subject with the peak to peak amplitude of that reflex. If, and they designed, of course, two conditions in which they had to try to use some mental strategy while the stimulation and the H reflex were generated to upregulate it or downregulate it. So if they, they wanted to upregulate it, they would provide some feedback if in real time, every time the stimulus was delivered in order to promote this neuroplasticity, this engagement in this operant condition and paradigm and so on. So they had to downregulate it, they would have the opposite effect. So they were asked to, by the mental power, try to get it done. And this is some sort of operant conditioning that the subject doesn't, uh, don't have an strategy or don't know how to do it, but they learn how to do it. And the results were like, considering this is the control baseline uh, condition H reflex uh, at the baseline, when the intervention started session after session, 
the subjects that were asked to upregulate the H reflex, average, let's say 20% there's some variability, they actually managed to get this reflex upregulated just by providing like neurofeedback. Why? Uh, but the group that were asked to downregulate it, they did the opposite quite well. And even a few weeks after all, uh, the changes, even the therapy was discontinued, the changes remained. So it's a really nice example of how brain states through operant conditioning can be estimated from the periphery, in this case with the H reflex paradigm. So the supraspinal input projected into the motor, uh, into the spinal cord, can be used in order to provide some neurofeedback. The subjects were able to use this neurofeedback to adapt to this neurofeedback. And the following steps or the question was like, are these neural adaptations specific for this circuit? So we change the H reflex. The, the H reflex. What does it mean? Is there any functional improvement? There is not. Uh, these changes are also happening at some part of the of the brain cortex. It's only happening on this specific circuit. So the theory these people always are, are raising is that the changes, plastic changes, are not specific of just one single uh, circuit, but are widespread through the central nervous system. And it's just the central nervous system, the one that manages the different circuits available, for instance, the H reflexes, corticospinal pathways, and it's able to just use this new neuromodulated uh, circuit adapted to the different behaviors. So a couple of years ago, the same people conducted the same experiment, but they went one step farther. They did it with the spinal cord injury patients. And also they did it uh, while the subjects were doing some uh, locomotion. Because what is true, for instance, for very steady conditions such as a standard, maybe it might be different for real daily activities such as the gait. And the gait is always a good example for this kind of experiment because it's a cyclic moving movement and you can synchronize, for instance, the H reflex and you can lock it to the different phases of the gait stance or swing. Uh, and this can be done with the ENG or even like quite simple, just with some, uh, for instance, force platform on some kinematics measurements. Um, this study was conducted in spinal cord injury patients, which they tend to suffer from hyperreflexia. So the goal wouldn't be to upregulate it, but to downregulate the H reflex. And they show, like, by pairing the H reflex at very specific phases of the swing uh, cycle, the H reflex was modulated. And even for some weeks follow ups, like this remain regulated. Well, for the subjects that didn't follow this, this is the control group. The stimulation was not delivered in synchrony. The, the neurofeedback was not, was not applied. Like they were not able to, to modulate the H reflex. But for the subjects who really follow like this neuromodulation paradigm, the H reflex was modulated. And these changes didn't only happen for the very specific phase in which they were trained, but for all the phases of the gate cycle. And this is translated in some functional uh, improvement for this subject because hyperreflexia doesn't allow you maybe to extend uh, or flex, uh, in this case, the ankle. And after this, the subject showed some functional improvement. Um, the next. Uh, Example is the neuromodulation of beta bands. Like um, there was another study by, by Jaime and I'm sure too uh, later by Mario, in which they show like beta events can be detected in the CST from the periphery. And actually, these estimations are more accurate compared to the esti traditional estimation of the corticomuscular coherence with surface ENG. And also, as Jaime was explaining before, like only the fastest corticosplenal fibers contribute to the beta boost transmission from the cortex to the periphery. They designed a very simple pipeline in which you have the high density EMG and the EG concurrent recordings in both uh, locations. So the high density EMG will be the composed, then we can identify the beta waves, and at the same time we have the EG, we do some preprocessing, some spatial filtering, we identify the beta waves. And then we can have some estimation of the corticomuscular coupling. And we are going to review this pipeline later in the hands-on training. So Emmanuel uh, Abagnano, a PhD student, 
will go step by step showing how from EG and identity in the recordings, how we can get these kind of uh, nice plots in which we show like how the beta bars happening in the cortex are actually transmitted in the um, to the periphery. So in this like uh, spectrum uh, wavelet functions, we can see how for the beta bands around here, we can have in the EG, we have these EG bars, uh, beta bars that are also happening at the same time in the CST. And why this is important? Because this information can be used in a neuromodulation paradigm that uh, we have it here. So this consisted in having the subject uh, training to produce some isometric contractions in order to have the estimation of the real time uh, online decomposition filters by a framework developed by Darren. And then, so the subjects, once the filters were computed, the subject was asked to perform this isometric contraction. So the motor units were identified in real time. And then through this uh, processing from the motor units, the beta bars was, were extracted from the, uh, from the high density MG. And a neurofeedback based on the beta power, this activity was provided to the subject while he was maintaining the same force level in order to upregulate the beta bars with positive feedback or downregulate the beta bars with negative feedback. And the results were promising because from the periphery, so the beta bars, when the subjects were asked to upregulate in this case or downregulate the beta activity, again, no instructions are given to the subject how to do this. They just manage their way through this operant conditioning and reward system to control the, their brain uh, oscillations. They will manage to have this increase or decrease in beta band depending on the paradigm they were following. And also, these changes were also uh, happening and reflected in the EG. So it's another uh, evidence that goes in support in the theory that the EG, the, the beta bars uh, are happening both and the EG, and we can measure them in the in the periphery as well. And now we are, I'll show another example, like it's on process, uh, or maybe it could be a potential feature of neuromodulation too. Uh, we have recurrent inhibition, which is a very simple spinal circuit in which the Renshaw cells that are located at the spinal cord produce uh, or are in charge of uh, inhibiting the same motor units. And this mechanism is not present in every single muscle in the body. It, it varies from joint to joint, but it is important to keep the inhibition and the control and to decrease the firing rate of the motor units. Um, this can be measured through traditional neurophysiological techniques based on the stimulation, stimulating the, the alpha motor neurons and then measuring the the, the response in, in the motor unit. And there are some studies um, conducted by, for instance, by Gorken that show that uh, in some pathologies uh, such as uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, like this recurrent inhibition is actually decreased compared to healthy subjects. So this is the length, the duration of the recurrent inhibition and it's severely hampered for these kind of patients. So uh, we have this idea of how uh, with Cork and Philip on how we could use the high density MG information from the periphery be used to estimate the state of these range of cells that could be also at some point modulated by the supraspinal pathways. So what we did, uh, it was a very simple paradigm that it's used with uh, single motor unit identification with needle electrodes, but in this case, we use the high density MG. So you apply the stimulation to the tibial nerve, uh, for the solids, and then we record the high density MG with the composite motor units, and then we get the post stimulus time histogram. So we average the responses following, like the trigger we recorded after each stimulus. And then we get something like this, which uh, this is the firing probability across the more than 150 trials. I don't know how many we have here. And we were expecting to see some inhibition here, but we didn't uh, in the one of the pilots we ran. And it was kind of disappointing. And this red line is the, the baseline. So before the stimulus was delivered, 
But one of the good things about the high density in G and the motor unit decomposition is that we can take a look at individual motor units and see what happened. And by doing that, we could see like some motor units were showing like quite high activity. And this is because these motor units actually they were receiving one airframe projections. And this is the H reflex. Everything is shifted around 15 milliseconds because instead of selecting the onset of the motor unit potential, it was selected the middle of the motor action potential. So everything should be shifted 15 milliseconds. But anyway, like these motor units were, were receiving H reflex for sure, which that's why we have this increase in the activity here. And also, this is the M wave uh, measured at the different uh, motor units. But by selecting just the motor units that were receiving the recent inhibition, Oh, that's our hypothesis. We can reconstruct the post stimulus time histogram, and then we could see like how the inhibition is happening at, at the time we we expect it. So this kind of technologies will give us better resolution yeah, in order to estimate some uh, properties from the spinal cord. And how this could be applied, for instance, for some uh, neuromodulation. See, if we are allowed to do this in real time, we could provide this recurrent inhibition as they did previously in the H reflex, so it could be applied to any other spinal pathway in order to to try to downregulate or upregulate the, the specific uh, neural circuits. And then we move to the last uh, part of the talk, uh, which is based on phase dependent stimulation and particularly applied to the tremor application. Um, we have pathological tremor, which is uh, a condition, it's a disease. Well, many diseases uh, are sharing this, this symptom in which something at the brain level, it could be at the cerebellum, it could be something in the whole cerebellum, thalamocortical loop. It's sending oscillatory inputs, um, involuntary oscillatory inputs to the spinal cord. And then we have the proper spinal system, we have the afferent system, the spinal reflexes that might contribute to exac exacerbate this tremor and make it like a resonance. So we have all these circuits, and we can use uh, high density EMG or just surface EMG from the periphery that will give us very nice estimation of the oscillations uh, happening at the cortex because it's quite cyclic signal and it's quite strong compared to the uh, voluntary movements. And one example of how the high density EMG can be used in order to improve this was one study uh, performed by Alex Holobar in which they computed some EG filters based uh, on the, high de the motor units extracted from the high density EMG in some term of patients. And if all these plots are just the corticomuscular coherence between the EEG at the different channels and the CST. And you can see, like, we should expect some very prominent peaks here around four, five, six, nine hertz, such as the one we have here, which is the power spectrum of the CST, so motor unit synchronously fired at the thermal frequency. But the corticomuscular coherence was not so good. So instead of using the EEG channels, we use the motor unit-based filters applied to the EEG to reconstruct the EEG signal. When estimating the corticomuscular coherence with that signal and the CST, we get great boost in the thermal band, which is what we expect. So that's why high density MG provides value estimation of, of cortical activity. And this is aligned with what we've been seeing in the previous slides. And now let's focus on thermal. So thermal is oscillatory signals coming from the brain. We don't know where the oscillator is really. It could be that it's located at different places and there's some uh, interconnection between them, but this finally project to the muscles. And the patients have this kind of flexion extension tremor, pronunciation initial tremor, and for many times um, uh, these muscles are out of phase, but sometimes are not. One study performed by Juan uh, a few years and Dari and Jaime as well a few years ago, they showed that the phase difference between the neural drives to antagonist muscle flexors and extension of the wrist uh, is associated to the relative strength of the supraspinal, but not only the supraspinal, but also the afferent. So the subjects were holding a posture, so there's some stronger supraspinal input and voluntary input. Both flexors and extensors are out of phase. While if the subjects are at rest, the, the tremor seems to be realigned and both flexors and extensors 
happening in phase, uh, activation happening in phase. And the afferent, according to this model, the afferent inputs have an important role in this shift as well because of the reflex loops. Then um, I want to just highlight this reciprocal inhibition pathway, which means like when we have the activation of the one afferent fibers, it will produce the activation of the same fiber as we saw before. But that actually happened for quite high intensity stimulus. But what, ha what actually happened for low intensity stimulus even below the motor threshold is that the antagonist muscle is inhibited. And this mechanism allows us to really freely move flexion extension movements because when one muscle is active, the other one has to be relaxed. Following this strategy, uh, a few years ago, they came with the idea of having this out of phase strategy or this out of phase term based on flexion extension activation. And through the afferent pathways, we could uh, stimulate the antagonist muscle in order to inhibit that muscle get the tremor reduced and therefore do it in online. So Dosen proposed this strategy in the first time, this out of phase strategy, so you can easily get the tremor amplitude from the and from the EMG bars because it's close enough to um, and like a stable and tremor you can predict where the next bars are going to happen because while the stimulation is applied, uh, you get massive stimulation artifact and you want to, you don't want to get that. So you just predict when the tremor will happen and you stimulate in counterface with the antagonist muscle also. Um, a few years ago, we continue with this technique and instead of trying to predict, we rather uh, assume that the muscles could be in phase uh, we propose another strategy in which we would just get like very short root minute square recordings from the EMG in order to estimate if the muscle was in phase or of phase, both conditions could be allowed. And then if the uh, estimation of the muscle activity will exceed a given threshold, we would provide the stimulation to the antagonist muscle and so on. And we tested this stimulation first in healthy subjects. So the stimulation while the subjects were doing this wrist flexion extension was applied in phase or out of phase to different groups in two different days. And we measure the reciprocal inhibition, the strength of the reciprocal inhibition after the after the, the intervention. So we have here like the condition, the baseline H reflex, which is the red line. And when you condition the H reflex by stimulating the, the antagonist nerve, you get a slightly reduced H reflex if the timing is it's adequate for that subject. What we wanted to show is that by following in phase stimulation, so the stimulation was applied in phase with the muscle activity, we had this kind of behavior. Like after 20 minutes of stimulation, the reciprocal inhibition at the wrist level was actually uh, enhanced. So we can see it here in this plot over here. So after 20 minutes of stimulation for the in phase group, we had a decrease in the reciprocal inhibition. Well, an increase in the reciprocal inhibition. So this circuit was facilitated, while for the opposite condition, the out of phase, we had the opposite effect. And this was a, like we were trying to show some evidence how this phase dependent neuromodulation actually has an impact on the spinal circuits. When we translated this to, um, to some uh, essential tumor patients, we did this with intramuscular stimulation with Sylvia Dario and other collaborators. And we applied like this kind of stimulation in different trials in which the simulation was turned on or not. Uh, this is one example in which we have the pre-assessment. We have one segment of this stimulation when it's turned on and then off, and then we have the post-assessment. And when we look at the tremor reduction, uh, let's just look at this one over here, between the stimulation periods and the off period, we found that there was, this is normalized metric, and this uh, corresponds to 32% thermal reduction, acute thermal reduction, while the stimulation was applied with intramuscular stimulation with the closed loop system. While, while doing the same with the open loop stimulation, we didn't get any thermal reduction at all, and even the thermal got worse. 
And the results were not only limited to the acute tremor reduction, but the most powerful effects appear uh, after the, the stimulation was delivered, so a few minutes after, because um, for these all red bars, it means like the, if, if it's about 0.5, it means the tremor remain reduced after the, exper the experiment for a few minutes and for sub subjects even 24 hours. And this is delivered with the stimulation when it's applied uh, in phase, I mean, sorry, out of phase with the closed loop condition. But when applied with the same intramuscular electrodes with the open loop condition, continuous stimulation, we have so much variability. So the important thing is that, again, timing the stimulation with the neural oscillations that are happening at the different levels of the nervous system uh, might have or seems to have an impact in the outcomes we want to get. And this is the promotional video we made. Uh, uh, it isn't a TV commercial, but we have to start it at the beginning. With the channel, we measure it. Then we get the insertion of the thin film electrodes uh, developed by from Hofer Institute. They are quite similar, but the ones that we are using these days and Sylvia is using these days or there. So we get these sensors in the, the insertion in the extensors and flexors guided by ultrasound. So now the needle is removed and the electrode remains inside. You can see the tiny electrode there. And then we calibrated the, we did the pre-assessment of the basin internal, and then we started the stimulation trials. Trial by trial, the stimulation was randomly turned on and off during 30 seconds period. At some point, the online thermal reduction was not so evident for some patients, even the statistics says like there's some thermal reduction measured by the accelerometer, but what we could see is for some of the patients afterwards, after receiving this closed loop stimulation, there was a visible uh, functional improvement for some of them. A continuation of this work uh, like was done by Patricia up there in itself. So instead of, we were using previously just the surface EMG to get the estimation of the thermal, but they went one step farther and they uh, applied this framework to, to have the real time decomposition of both flexors and extensors to get the single motor units uh, here. And then uh, a PLL uh, system in order to track the phase of the CST. So you could track in real time the phase of the thermal based on the motor unit output, which in theory would give you like more reliable estimation of the thermal because you don't have crosstalk between masses because you know the motor units are specific uh, from the masses you are reporting from. And um, this framework was proposed and it was only tested in one case study, but I think it's the immediate uh, feature uh, of one of the future pro uh, projects that will be developed uh, at this lab. Now let's go for a final summary of some uh, technical tips when highlighting the importance of timing and stimulation. So again, like to sense timing is essential to activate the target brain circuits. So we need precision of milliseconds. And in order to do so, we need to make sure like the recording, um, like the biofeedback system we are using must be properly synchronized. The external triggers and between acquisition systems, we need to guarantee like they are properly recorded with very high time accuracy. And this is just some examples of some of the tools we use, like Psych Toolbox, and some of you use them, PsychoPy, the people from UPC, or we also have some more analog uh, system like the CD that we'll take a look later on the Hanson training activities. Um, a final home message, uh, home tech message, is that to modulate neural activity towards the restoration of physical rhythms in neural disorders. That's our goal, for instance, in Parkinson's disease or a stroke, there is beta uh, band like decrease compared to healthy subjects. In essential thermal patients, we have some aberrant oscillatory uh, inputs in the spinal cord, like uh, causing these oscillations. So first, we, didn't, we need to identify the, the aberrant neural rhythms that are happening because we cannot just apply random strategy to see if it works or not. We can do it, but we have less chance to, to succeed and we won't know why it's happening. 
So once we've identified that, we will design the specific neuromodulation paradigm targeting uh, the specific neuromodulation of the circuits. In the case of stroke or Parkinson's disease, maybe we could aim at getting some uh, beta uh, up regulation, trying to get it towards uh, uh, normal uh, values. And then the final outcome will, will be to get this, this function of the program. Other applications of all these normal neuromodulation or biofeedback uh, techniques we've been seeing here in this talk uh, can be applied to movement augmentation, which doesn't necessarily translate to uh, neural rehabilitation. It can be just movement augmentation in order to control uh, additional degrees of freedom, to control external devices or parameters, assistive devices. And one of the proposals would be to take advantage of this and use or not known uh, use for these frequency bands such as beta or delta in order to teach the subjects to regulate this activity in order to provide some external control for different devices. And the final slide, it's like, I know the whole workshop had the title of brain computer interfaces, but hybrid brain computer interfaces and maybe like uh, one good point would be to move this kind of terms that EEG was quite popular a few years ago getting the activity from the brain non-invasively seems quite appealing but it has some limitations so maybe we can get the same information or complementary information from other meanings by other meanings like uh, which will give us also information we can take advantage of and just with the name of neural interfaces both in the actuation side and the getting information from it so that's it <laughs>